Hey, good morning, Wesleyan Chapel family. Uh, this is Kyle. Super glad to be here um, worshiping with you guys. Um, we were talking about at a church meeting this week that uh, these worship services, even though they're online and kind of funny, are, are not meant to be performative or consumed by you. You guys are very much worshiping with us, and um, we pray that we would feel your worship and your presence as we, as we worship here today. Uh, we had a lot of changes this week, um, and uh, one of the things that changed are the, the songs that we decided to do. Um, and I changed most of the music that we were doing yesterday and tried to pick songs that really exemplify um, unity and a recognition of our own sin and imperfection and of God's powerful hand and his love for us. Um, so this opening hymn that we'll sing is All Creatures of Our God and King. Uh, by the way, there won't be lyrics on your screen today, but uh, if you'll see in the description of the video below, there's a link to a document that includes all the lyrics to the hymn so, so that you can sing along with us. So let's sing All Creatures of Our God and King. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him, Alleluia, Thou burning sun with golden green, Thou silver moon with softer green.
so thankful to be here together, even though we're separate, Lord, worshiping you with loud voices of joyful praise. It's hard, God, in the midst of uh, all of the sadness and strife uh, that's happening right now, um, but God, we are called to praise you and be your light, even when it's hard, and even when we don't necessarily feel it and feel that joy and that light. Uh, we pray, God, that you would fill us with that light and let us be your presence in this world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, buddy. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome again to Wesleyan Chapel. Thanks for turning into our YouTube channel. Um, as church leaders in times like these, it is important that we speak truth. And it seems like truth is such a loaded term these days, but um, I just ask for, for open minds this morning as you listen to these words. And um, I pray that they will be received well. The title of this sermon is How Effective Discipleship Leads Us Away from Things Like Racism and Hatred and Injustice. We celebrated Ascension Sunday about a month ago, and then we celebrated Pentecost two weeks ago. And if you remember from our time together, those, those two days mark the days that Jesus gave his final instructions to his disciples and then the day that the Holy Spirit empowered them to carry out those instructions, to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which Pastor Jeff preached about last week in the text from uh, Matthew 28. So if we follow the church calendar, you know, we have the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, his crucifixion, and resurrection, his commissioning of the Twelve and his ascension to the Father, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then we come to the part where the apostles actually go out and do the work. And that's what we're going to focus on today, is how to do the work. As Jeff pointed out last Sunday, the disciples didn't have an instruction manual. They were trying to figure everything out as they went along. And they didn't have the Bible as we know it today. But they had the Holy Spirit, and they had the traditional Jewish scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament, and maybe most importantly, they had each other. They were discipling each other while they were making disciples of all the nations, which is to say, in one respect, that discipling each other, being there for one another, was equally important, maybe even fundamentally important, to being able to be there for others. Like it says in Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And all you have to do to see how important this concept is for the transformation of the world is take a look around. In the last two years, there have been more reasons for us to be there for one another than any other time that I can remember. I mean, we've had Hurricane Florence and then Hurricane Dorian, wildfires in the West, mass shootings across the country, COVID, which we're still in the shadow of, and now we have rioting and protesting and, and just hatred, all of this racially charged stuff that's going on with racial injustice and police brutality and things like that. And it just seems like everyone is, a, is in a very different place right now. Some are fine, and life is good, and there's really nothing to fret about. And others are mourning the death of loved ones. Others are picking up the pieces of their lives and businesses that have literally been shattered by violence. And there's kind of a crazy amount of fear going around right now. People are really revving high and... Some are being totally overtaken by the moment and completely losing themselves in overgeneralizations and hatred and rage. So what do we do? What can any one person do to make a difference? 
And when it's all said and done and our time winds down on this earth, will we be able to look back on our lives and know that we've made a positive difference in this world? Well, I guess that all depends on how you see things. Do you remember the story of the man named Hur from the Old Testament? No, <laughs> you, you probably don't remember the story of the man named Hur, but we should. We should, because without Hur, the entire nation of Israel might never have made it out of the desert. Which means that God's plan for redemption through Jesus might not have happened in the same way that it did. So who was this guy? Well, let's jump into the text and find out. You're not going to see a scripture uh, posted on the screen, so you can either listen or you can grab your Bible and read it. But the reading is from Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 13. And it goes like this. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Now Sir Hur, sorry, our unsung hero, he did a simple thing. Along with Aaron, he helped Moses hold up his hands when he became too weak to do so on his own. So in other words, in order for some battles to be won, people have to get in there and prop each other up when they become too weak to keep on going. And if that isn't immediately applicable to what's going on in our day and time, I don't know what is. With his help, Moses was able to pray and save his people. But even though God was with Moses, Moses still needed the help of his earthly brethren. And so do we. You see, what we don't read in this text is that just before this happened, the people were not supportive of Moses. In fact, they were about to stone him to death because he had led them to a place in the desert where there was no water to drink. And frustrated and desperate, Moses prayed to God. He was fed up with the people that he was charged to lead and to care for. And that's what happens sometimes, doesn't it? We're called to love one another and to care for each other, to lift each other up, bandage each other's wounds, and care for the poor and the widow and the foreigner and the orphan, regardless of our differences. But it's not always easy to do, is it? I wish it was, <laughs> but it's not. And sometimes it's hard to love the people that God calls us to care for. So does that mean that we just abandon the charge and quit? No. You know, Moses could have just bailed on the people when they turned on him, which they did more than once. Surely his life would have been much easier if he just abandoned the unruly mob. But he didn't. And no matter how unruly the mob becomes... God does not abandon the mob. We are the mob. And every protester who throws a brick, uses hate-filled speech, pulls a trigger, or lights a fire, we see our very own potential. And in every private conversation between friends, where people judge the mob for the escalation of force, we also become anger. The same anger, in fact, that incites the mob itself. 
the potential to be driven by anger and rage until there is no more of us left exists in all people. When we succumb to rage, we become unrecognizable to our, fan, our families and our friends and even to ourselves. Anyone who has ever felt the pain of a loved one's angry fist knows what I'm talking about. On the other end of the spectrum of human potential, as far away from hate and destruction as the East is from the West, we see Jesus, the Christ. And as followers of Jesus, we would do well to consider how he handled racism and discrimination. Considering the fact that racism and discrimination were very real in his day, we see the way he conducted himself in accounts like the Samaritan woman at the well or the Good Samaritan. In both of those stories, it was race and discrimination that separated the Jews and the Samaritans. The fact that Jesus sat down and struck up a conversation with what was then to be considered a half-bred harlot says a lot about his views on the matter. Mainly that those things didn't matter. What's going on on the outside? Now, the parable of the Good Samaritan is essentially Jesus shining a spotlight back on his own people, saying, you think you know what someone is like based on what you see on the outside, but in reality, you have no idea. We see his teachings on equality and the way that he defended the woman accused of adultery, saying to her accusers, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Friends, who of us is without sin? It's really easy to sit and judge others based on what we think we know of them. But the reality is, most of us have no clue what it is like to walk a mile in the shoes of those that we are judging. Oh, and let's not forget Jesus' teachings on that either. Remember, he said, go the second mile. Yeah, perhaps we ought to start walking the first mile carrying someone else's load before we judge them. Just a thought. But then again, who am I? Right? Who am I? I'm just another Joe trying to do what I think is right, as is everybody else. And Jesus knew what it felt like to be an outsider and not have equal standing even amongst his own people, saying foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to call his own. Luke 9, 58. So how did Jesus respond? And what can we learn from his example? Well, one of the most consistent attributes of Jesus' ministry is his willingness to engage in conversation with just about anyone. He spoke to those who loved him, those who wanted to learn from him, and that's easy, sure, but he was willing and he engaged in conversation with people who were judging him and ultimately those who would destroy him. He knew that in order to reach people where they were, he first needed to listen to what they were saying. And since Jesus was divine and he knew the hearts of men and he could read minds, we can safely assume that his listening was not for his benefit, but was for the benefit of those who opposed him. In other words, he understood the value of a person's need to be heard. Yeah, if he just busted in on people's lives without listening to them, telling them what they needed to be doing, stop doing this, stop doing that, you need to do this, you need to do that, nobody was going to listen to him, and nobody listens to that. And the same goes for today. Clearly, people want, need to be heard and understood. And so perhaps the world could benefit from just a little more listening. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we all have a choice in how we respond to injustice. Moses had a choice to abandon his people. Her had a choice to help Moses raise his hands in prayer when his strength failed him. And we have a choice to learn through effective discipleship and strive to become better lovers. To love people like God loves people. 
or not. Recently, our bishop, Pope Morgan Ward, put out a statement on justice and equality, and I invite you to watch it. It's at the, uh, it's on the United Methodist website. It's nccumc.org. Um, we don't have any, you know, fancy slides or, or tech support today. It's just Kyle and I, but if you Google ncc dot nccumc.org, it'll take you to the page and you'll be able to see it. It's the first thing that comes up. But anyway, she summons the annual conference to affirm our beliefs and convictions surrounding issues of racism and injustice through three things, witness, protest, and promise, especially in support of minority communities. And the last line sums it up well. It says this, it says, we promise to be lifelong learners, to constantly make adjustments in the way we use our power and influence, to be active participants in the building of the beloved community, and ultimately, growing always in holiness towards the perfection we see in Christ. Like the apostles, we can feel like we're lacking an instruction manual on how to move right now. We find ourselves wondering what to say, what not to say, and how to discuss the issues at hand in productive ways. And thankfully, like the apostles, we too, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we have that Christ power to, to move forward with love and understanding and nonviolence and with each other. And we also have the benefit of generations of positive church leadership to learn from, as well as negative church leadership to learn from. And as Pastor Jeff pointed out last Sunday, you know, we need to do more in the way of having conversations about these issues of racism and stereotyping and prejudice. And they may never go away entirely, but naming injustice when we see it and having conversations about it will enable us to learn to overcome them together. Yeah, because it's through the discussions themselves. Discipleship is all about discussions and intimacy, and it's through those discussions and intimacy that we learn to listen and to understand each other more deeply. And in that deeper understanding, that is what leads us away from things like hate and racism and prejudice. And speaking of learning from church leaders and, and having the discussions, you know, Pastor Jeff and I have had many over the last two years, as well as, you know, Kyle and myself and, and the leadership team, we talk frequently about the issues that are going on in the world, and we haven't always agreed on everything, but I speak for all of us when I say that even though we have differences of opinion, we're all learning from one another. There's an old saying that goes, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, it's only half the saying. The other half says, when the student is truly ready, the teacher will disappear. Teachers move in and out of our lives. And in turn, we, we move in and out of people's lives as teachers and as colleagues and friends, and we become other things. And raising children is an example of this. For the first half of a child's life, parents are protectors, caregivers, and teachers. And then we start stepping back a little bit to let our children navigate their lives on their own, but we still have our hands poised, postured, and ready to catch them if they fall down. But the next step is perhaps the hardest step for parents. We have to go against our instincts to save our children, and we have to let them fall down. And we do this not intentionally to cause them harm, but to teach them how to pick themselves up again when they fall. And that's kind of where we are as a society right now. We need to be there for each other to be able to pick each other up, pick ourselves up and get out of this crazy cycle. We need positive role models all the way around in every community, with every race, everything, positive role models. Because if a child falls down and there's no one there to show them how to pick themselves up and brush themselves off and move on, then disastrous things happen. 
Who would that child look to for love and guidance if there is no one there? If all a child sees is anger and violence and hate and discrimination, what are the odds that that child will grow up to be a person of peace? If there is no loving parents to wrap their arms around their babies and hold them when they are afraid, then the seeds of fear become deeply ingrained in the psyche of those children, of our children, who then grow up to perpetuate the cycles that we see. We need more lovers in the world. We need more willing hearts to reach down into the muck and mire and just hug on some kids. We need more role models for children to look at and say, Mommy, I want to be just like her when I grow up, or just like him when I grow up. Ask your children, parents, who are their heroes? You'll likely get an answer. It's probably the name of one of the Avengers, right? Iron Man or Captain America or Black Widow or whatever, or some fictional co comic book character. And we giggle a little bit because we know it's true and it's cute, sure. Yeah, cute maybe for a minute until we realize that those characters, those heroes and role models, they aren't real people. Where are the real heroes of today? Peaceful protesters, people who are communicating effectively, spilling their hearts in ways that other people who oppose their thinking can understand. I'll tell you where some of these other heroes lie. They're on the front lines every day, giving their lives so that the rest of us can tear ourselves apart. As a Marine Corps veteran and a grandson of a former police officer, brother to a firefighter, and friend to numerous nurses and first responders, I am appalled at how quickly we destroy the image of our heroes because of the actions of a few. And I am equally appalled at how quickly we demonize people who are protesting injustice that is very real in their everyday lives. We might take care not to overgeneralize and stereotype those who are protesting. Not all protesters are bad people, just like not all police officers are racist. Mostly, things are not always what we perceive, and neither are people. But then again, that's what low-level thinking does. We divide, we label, we seek to destroy. We are the mob. When we burn each other down, all we're left with is ashes. And what can you build with ashes? If you want to change the world, you first have to become the change you seek in the world. If you want to be heard, you have to learn to listen. If you want peace, you must become peace. If you want harmony, you have to think and speak and be harmonious. And all of this comes through leadership, discipleship, and example. If there was no one there to show you the way, to mentor you, and to get in there and prop you up when your strength is failing you, if you have no one in your life to help you sharpen your iron, to be a better human being, where will you be? Where will we all be? I guess we'll be right here, right where we are now. Lord, help us. God, have mercy. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, have mercy on us, Lord. Help us to see that these cycles of violence are not the answer. That the anger and the frustration that bubbles up inside of us no matter what our skin color is, no matter what our gender is. These feelings are real and they're warranted on all sides. And my prayer this morning, God, is that we would just learn to listen. Not to listen for a break in the conversation so that we can just inject our points and drive them home and drive people back. That's not listening. But that we would really, really listen, God to the cry of the needy. Forgive us for not doing that already, God. We love you and we give you thanks and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Uh, this next song is by uh, an extremely talented uh, African-American singer, uh, Liz Vice, um, and it's called All Must Be Well. And I've been really impacted by this sentiment this week, not necessarily the passive all is well or all will be well, but the insistent all must be well. Through the love of God our Savior, free and changeless is his favor. Precious is the blood that healed us, perfect is the grace that sealed us, strong is hand stretched out to shield us, all must be well. To close today, uh, we've got a beautiful hymn, one of the greatest songs ever written, a recognition of our imperfections and of God's unbelievable love for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see t'was great my heart 
was blind, but now I see. We love you guys. Truly, we love you. We know COVID is a real thing, but man, the world could benefit from a big hug right now. So find a loved one who you're not afraid to hug and give them one today. We love you guys. We can't wait to be through all this mess. And we just pray for each and every one of you. Remember, you're the church. Church starts now. We'll see you next time. And we love you. Bye.